Thank you for joining us. And um, we, we get a little bit of the thanks, too, because we got them out of really bad weather yeah. uh, uh, <laughs> from the winter of um, Minnesota to the sunny climes of Southern California. So uh, let's just start with some sort of basics, which is how long have you been at, at, at Target now? Well, I've only been, I've been there less than two years. Um, I moved out from London. I was in Tesco for, say, which is a big UK grocer for about 17 years before that. Um, I've been, it's been a blast. I've really loved it, actually. It's been, it's been a fantastic move. A um, bit strange moving from London to Minneapolis, I have to say. <laughs> I still have to explain to my friends and family where Minneapolis is, which is kind of, you know where Chicago is, turn left a bit, up a bit. Try Irvine, it's it. a lot harder. <laughs> um, so, um, when you walked into uh, Target two years ago then, like, what did you, you know, we've all heard about what happened before that. Mm -hmm. um, Roxanne, who's here, spoke last year. Um, what did you find in terms of sort of the digital story at Target when you took over the reins as CIO? Well, I think um, I'd say a few things. One is that you kind of walk into Target and it's full of extraordinarily capable people. I mean, it's really, really surprising that, you know, just how capable the folks are. But I, I think you know, the reality is Target how it has lagged uh, digitally. Uh, I mean, the re we've only, only had our own kind of commerce website for the last six years. Before that, we were on somebody else's marketplace, yes. right? So, um, so it was a, it, you know, it was it started behind the other, some of the others, and you know, most people had had uh, an e-commerce site since the early 2000s, so we're a good 10 years behind the pace. Um, but they've done extraordinary work to catch up since, um, and now I think we can be actually very proud of what we do from an e-commerce perspective. You know, we've got a website that actually works really well. It it reflects Target as a brand. Um, and we've got you know great great fulfillment options. Um, we grew twice the twice the market last year, twice the rate of market, twenty seven percent growth, forty percent growth in December. So we have something. We have a, we have a winning proposition here. Um, we have a really really good foundation. And now is the time for us probably to step on. So let's so let's walk that back a little bit and and, and talk about uh, just from a big picture perspective. Sure. What was the retail landscape? I mean, everybody knows about sort of obviously Amazon and Walmart as being two hefty competitors, but we also see Sears going, getting into trouble and others as well. But what, how do you see sort of the competitive space in retail these days? Well, look, I think everybody wants um, retail to be, you know, digital or stores. You know, everybody's betting it's one or the other. Um, but the, the reality is it's going to be both, and it's going to be both for a long time. I, um, you know, when you, your, your story about Spotify resonated with me. You know, when I was, when I was growing up in Dublin, uh, retail was defined by Cleary's department store on mm -hmm. O'Connell Street. You know, that's all I knew. Um, so we only bought things that were as available in Cleary's. But now, of course, um, what's available to me is hundreds of millions of, of products from thousands and thousands of retailers. So you get to the paradox of choice. And I do believe, you know, um, uh, like your Spotify metaphor, that actually people will then focus back down on the brands, and, and one of those brands will be Target. Um, and that's why we are investing so much in creating new brands within, within the Target family. Um, we're going to launch 12 over the next uh, 18 months, addressing probably around 10 billion of our sales. So I, I think a Target as a brand will exist um, uh, long into the future. I think stores will exist long into the future because I, the, I as a retailer, have done some of the hard work of cutting down the choice for you. Um, and you'll come to you'll come to Target because we sell you know the brands that you like, great style and great value. So stores will continue to exist. There's no doubt though that the growth will be in digital. Um, so uh, as we as we you know we we therefore have to go all in on the on the digital journey, which is exactly what we're doing. So since you were not so nice enough to take away my gym and put it in a Target Express store, uh, yeah, right. uh, I'm just kidding. Um, um, let's, you probably, let's, probably use the Target store. I probably would use it more. Right? Yeah. Yeah, so. Now, now. Uh, 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 um, you so, just pay for the gym, right? There. So let, let, let's talk about that actually, because. These new stores, the smaller format stores, these are Target Expresses, I think they're called, right? Well, they're just saying yeah, Target. Well, tar Target. Uh, and, and these raise a whole new set of sort of software and algorithmic challenges because the product mix becomes far more important when you have less square footage. So can you talk from a sort of a technology perspective what this 
introduces into sort of the th kinds of problems you need to solve? Well, I, th there's there's two fundamentals you need to solve. Um, you're absolutely right. You know, when you when you're going into small localized stores, then they tend to serve a single demographic. Um, you know, whereas if you're in a big hypermarket, the demographic is very very wide. So you have to assort those stores um, very you know hyper locally. Um, and that's not what uh, we've we've grown up doing. You know, we've grown up shifting. You know, creating uniform stores right. and then shifting case pack to them. And that's the other thing about these stores is that you know you you you're best off replenishing them in in eaches in single units rather than than big cases. And both those things are fundamental challenges to any existing supply chain. So you're using a combination of um, you know, just good technology and a combination of artificial intelligence and, and other techniques to work out, A, what do you put in the store in the first place that's going to resonate with, the, with the, uh, the local community and a lot more cleverness in your, in your supply chain algorithms to, to push single units through the supply chain with the same efficiency as we've all been used to shifting whole cases through over the right. years. You know, it's easy to say in a few sentences, but sort of the, the physics of it is, is, is very, very complicated. Well, you know, we, we, we will be shifting, right? If you take a month, right? In a month, we'll shift a single, uh, about a billion single units. And you're doing that from you know, farms and factories all over the world to 1,800 outlets here in the United States. And you're trying to do it just in time. That's a math problem. Yes. That is a math problem, yeah. Um, I, I mean, not, not, not dissimilar to sorting out the, the LA traffic. Um, but you know, so you know, the more intelligence that you can apply to that, the better. And you know, you're absolutely right. You tend to layer on complexity. So you start with a simple set of rules, and then you get more data. You apply more intelligence until such a time that actually the whole of the supply chain process is, and all the decision making in it is, is automated. Um, and, and that's where we're, we're heading towards. So no human intervention. The, the systems order all the product. And I think that's a really powerful insight that sort of you, you don't see a lot of companies embrace yet, which is the notion of sort of you know, minimum viable product even when you're talking about a, a solution that you may use internally, which is what we, what, what's, what's productive today and how can we make it better over time? Which sort of changes the architecture with which you build these complex systems, I would imagine. Yeah, no, I, absolutely. I think you, know, you've, you, you need to look at um, in both architecture, you need to look at agility, you need to look at capability. And, you know, and if I look at my role as CIO, um, you know, that's what it's about. It's about building a great, an adaptable architecture. It's about creating creating agile working practices, and it's about creating engineering capability. It's those three things. Because, I mean, to be honest, nobody can tell what the future holds. I right. mean, it's become more and more and more uncertain. So you, all you've got to make sure is that you have the capability to go forward and to flex. So, you know, back to supply chain, we, we're, we're, you know, trying a whole load of different operations out in our supply chain. Uh, so we did an experiment in around the Minneapolis area where we cleared an area of one of our distribution centers and started working new processes into one of the local stores. Now, from, you know, from, from the get-go on that kind of pro project of work to go live until we were actually shipping product was 12 weeks. Mm -hmm. uh, and we rewrote the entirety of the supply chain systems in about eight weeks. We were four wow. weeks ahead of the game. Uh, and it was a team of four engineers two of whom were graduate, new graduates. And, you know, and that's, now is it perfect and is it scalable? In its current form, no, but we'll have to layer, and layer upon that and layer upon that again, which is exactly what we'll do. And so it's, it's getting that mindset of agility into people and that you don't actually have to create something that's utterly perfect before you launch it out right. on the world but that you just need something that's good enough to start from. Then you can test and learn. Because it's amazing what you learn in, um, in, in a very, very short space of time. And then you build upon that. So it is, you, need a, you need a good foundational architecture. We would never have been able to build item master systems in four weeks, but you can build supply chain algorithms in four weeks. So the underlying architecture has to be really solid and has to be adaptable. You need uh, agile, people who think agilely, who kind of want to get to create things and create it quickly, um, who are not pursuing perfection, but are pursuing minimum viable product or minimum lovable product, whichever, whichever way you want to look at it. Lovable is better. Lovable is good. Well, we tend to do minimum, but when we're looking at things, in, you know, we tend to look at, um, if we're going at, at guest-facing things, uh, we, we, we go minimum viable, we do for our internal trials. Then we go to minimum lovable before we, we put it out in the big world for our, for our customers to use. So it's interesting, you embraced what Jeff Bezos calls the two pizza rule, you know, 
four software engineers working on. Uh, that'd be a lot of pizza for two. It is for, a lot of pizza. For but two but people. software engineers eat a lot. They're, they're big uh, fellas. Whatever though. that means. Um, so let's talk a little bit about sort of um, like what the key because one of the things that I read in preparation for this was you inherited a lot of you saw an organization with a lot of competing priorities and and one of the things that you said when you took the job was soon after you took the job was let's drill down to four or five sort of key priorities. So can you walk us through sort of what you're focusing on? Well, I think you said when I, when I, when I joined, yeah, I had a, a, you know, a technology organization that had over 800 projects on the books. And you know, no matter how big a company you are, and Target's a big company, you never have 800 priorities. And you know, when you actually ask people what's important, it tended to come down to you know, a half a dozen things around our supply chain, brands, um, around the stores. So it was a fairly easy exercise to whittle things down. And I wouldn't even look at it as whittling down from 800. We more or less started from scratch again. Um, and all I did was go to my peers on the leadership team and say, OK, wh where do you want this valuable engineering resource spent? Um, and you know, we went through a very simple process. I gave them, um, I asked them to come prepared for, with their you know, requests for technology uh, over the following year. So they all came prepared, but then I told them they had to write it down in a post-it note, and I gave them five post-it notes each, um, which caused a bit of consternation. Everybody wanted more, and, and you know, I, could have sold, I could have sold a packet of post-it notes for a thousand bucks. <laughs> but anyway, uh, and then they wrote them down, and then we simply put them up on flip charts, which are, these are you know, the ones we're gonna do now, these are the ones we're gonna do next, and these ones we might get to. Really simple, but you're going back to what's the strategy of the company, um, where, therefore, how do you get the technology resources lined up against the things that are really important? Uh, so it wasn't a difficult process at all. The difficulty with doing too many things is that the important stuff just gets lost in this fog of inconsequence amongst all of the other things uh, that are going on. So getting people focused in on what was really important, uh, so it wasn't difficult. And for, for Target, you look forward, it's how we move forward our supply chain that's gonna be really, uh, really vital to us. It's growing our digital sales, it's improving our digital marketing, it's working on how we personalize promotions to the guest, how we uh, use smartphones or how our guests can use smart smartphones in our stores to make the shopping trip more enjoyable. They're not, you know, they're, right. the, the priorities are pretty obvious, right? Pretty obvious. And we just need people to be working on the obvious big priorities. So, so you heard it here, the Mike McNamara rule, five post-it notes, <laughs> uh, in addition to the, the, the two pieces. But, but you, you said something really interesting here, which is um, many things that are interesting, I should say. Um, but let's, because I know cartwheel and these, and just to make sure everybody comes up to speed on some of the things that you can now do in store with these technologies, mm -hmm. if you could talk about some of the key apps that you've built or any of the key initiatives that are consumer facing? Well, I think, you know, something, so Cartwheel is effectively our electronic couponing app, right? If you, you can download the app and um, we'll send you personalized um, uh, coupons. So they'll, they'll be sp uh, specific to you. And that's really great. And we get a huge penetration. And we get about probably around 3 million guests a week, you know, whip out their smartphone at the point of sale and, and redeem, redeem Cartwheel. Um, but more recently, what we've been doing is um, we've put uh, beacons in, mm -hmm. in a lot of our stores. So a few hundred of the stores have beacons now, and there'll be more by the end of the year. So that uh, when you go into the store, not only do you have the personalized promotion, but you have this lovely little Google Maps type thing, and you're a blue dot, and the thing that might, be, might interest you, specifically you as a guest, is marked out on a, on a, on a 2D map of the store. And it shows you the route to get there just like you would on Google Maps. So it's things like that which have real utility for guests and that, you know, that they can, again, we're, we're helping them filter down the paradox of choices, you know, filtering down um, to, to, the fewer, to the fewer choices that are relevant to them. I think that's immensely useful. Yeah, sort of the common theme in everything that you're saying is to be, you know, sort of there's, there's this push for hyper-efficiency in the supply chain and sort of people's time and a lot of this is just, you know, in Lyft's case, it was optimizing sort of, uh, you know, peak load management for the vehicles and things like that. But I think ultimately what we're seeing is what the technology is making available. Is, it's this huge push to the frontier of efficiency where 
Yeah, I think that's right. And I think it's because people's expectations exactly. have gotten much, much higher. I mean, like, you know, who would have imagined? You know, we, had, we had dinner last night. You walk out, you press the button on for a lift ride, and the, the thing turns up two minutes later. Right. And you expect that to happen nowadays, you know, in a way that, you know, I remember uh, back in my Tesco days, like we're talking late 90s here when we started Tesco.com. Um, which is a big, you know, it's probably still, probably still is the biggest uh, food and grocery online business in the world. You know, we used to get emails from, uh, from customers in the early days saying, hey, I ordered some stuff from you online and you delivered it. That's amazing. Right. You know? <laughs> I don't get many of those emails anymore, I have to say. <laughs> but, you know, our expectations just, you know, the expectations of consumers has is, is just um, risen and risen. You know, being, being led by people like Lyft, right? right. So they, they, they've created something entirely new and lifted our expectation. And as, and as, as businesses, as retailers, we have to fight hard to stay, to stay abreast of all of that. I'm going to shift gears a little bit. Um, one of the things that you said, which, 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 I, which I was really sort of surprised by, was sort of how people are, are really, companies are really not making money in, in digital retail. Mm -hmm. um, and that the cost that you, and the, the retailer faces the cost, or the, the, the effort that, for example, a home consumer would. Can you walk us through sort of the economics of that? Well, I think you know. I think if you, what is true is that if you added up uh, all of all of digital, all of e-commerce retail across the world and all businesses, I don't think you're going to get to a positive number yet. Now, and I don't. But I don't think that actually matters, right? So, I, I, and I'd give you an, an an analogy. I mean, clearly it matters that it gets to profitability. Sure, There's no doubt about that. Otherwise, we're all just busy fools. Um, but the, um, the, the, you know, if, if I take the analogy of Target, Target used to be a company called Dayton and Hudson, and then it was Marshall Fields, and that was a really great business, and it had a really, it had a 15% EBIT rate, you know, wonderful department store. Then along came Target at a lower EBIT rate in the in the early 60s, and of course Target completely outgrew what Marshalls and Dayton's was, they no longer exist and Target does. So I, I, I don't think that there's anything wrong that lower profit, rate profitability models come along, and if they do, um, that they can ultimately grow, grow larger than their parents. And I absolutely believe that the, you know, that's our opportunity, is not to be scared of that. I've been, in, you know, I've been in retail for over 20 years now, and in nearly through the entirety of my career, bricks and mortar retailers have been struggling with that. That actually, you know, we got this nice EBIT business over here, there's this less profitable one over here, how do we, how do we just kind of, you know, edge our way along, along that path? Meanwhile, Amazon, running by a different set of rules, a different set of financial rules, um, comes in and grows and grows. So I, I think we have to be brave. Uh, and I, I think Target has been very, very brave, particularly recently where we, uh, you know, we went into the market and we lowered expectations on earnings, uh, at least for, over the, for, for the next year. And that's because we do re need to reset our financial model to allow us to grow our digital business. I think that's absolutely fascinating because one of the things that our research shows over and over is sort of the commitment from the top and sometimes from boards about making the capital investments that allow you to invest in sort of the lower margin business yeah. rather than the higher margin business. And of course, in retail, there's a lot of synergies between the two as well. Of course there are. I mean, it's not really, I mean, it's not so much the capital investment. That seems to, that seems to be, um, you know, we, we, can, we, can, we can always argue, because you're generally buying property, right? And, and it, it has inherent value. I mean, the, the really brave thing from our leadership and our board is investing operating profit. Because that's hard to do. You know? right. and it's hard to do when you're, the expectation of the market is that you will improve your profitability each and every year. So that's a far more courageous step, but a necessary one. So how do you make that case to your executives? What, to our? To sort of like, to sort of, because there's a, there's a, a huge uncertainty about sort of what the, re, you know, we're all taught well, net look, present here, value. Here, here, and, the, the, certain, the one thing you can, like nobody can say, nobody can predict the future. The one thing is certain though, is that digital retail is growing. Uh, and that's where the growth in the market is going to come. Now, I say stores are going to be very, very important into the future uh, in the digital economy yes. as well. I mean, we've 1,800 stores. Those 1,800 stores are within 10 miles of 75% of Americans and about 85% of the retail market. Now, we've repurposed those stores to be as much distribution centers yes. and pickup points 
um, as they are, you know, uh, walk-in uh, uh, traditional stores. And that's been really, really important to us because it lower, it improves our economics. We're shipping stuff physically less distance. Um, and crucially, we're lower, lower lead times. So, you know, if you do an order pickup um, order, we'll have it ready for you in an hour or two. We can deliver next day because we're only delivering uh, short distances. So I think it's really, uh, it's really important. Those physical assets are, are really, really important. But digital is where the growth in the market is. And if you want to be a retailer and a strong retailer into the future, you have to invest in digital. No matter how uncertain that world is, you have to invest. And there's a lot of power, I think, in the narrative because you know, we can't make the case with numbers because you can, you know, a lot of companies, you see this in Silicon Valley, this, you know, the valuations sometimes don't seem justified by any sort of current measures of cash flow. That's true, but you look at some of them, I remember you know, the Facebook IPO, everybody was going, what on earth, right? How, how much? You know, um, but clearly, you know, they, they, they're the biggest media company on earth, probably. So um, it, it's it, you are very. It is a very, very uncertain future. There's no doubt about it. So all you got, you've just got to be ready and able. You've got to be brave and make the investments. You have to have the capability. That's why, you know, you know, back to some of the things you were saying earlier. That's why I brought all my engineering back in house. You know, I brought it back in house because software is so, so important to the way we are going to trade and operate and so important to our competitive advantage that I don't want to give that to a third party to do. You know, it's our IP. It's really, really important. No, that's fascinating because I spent some time working for a big outsourcer, C Computer Sciences Corporation. Mm -hmm. And, and no, you know, we, did, we did big deals with JP Morgan and companies like that. And now this, this the, you know, the, the, the shift is completely in the other direction. I mentioned some of the companies already like Delta and Ford and Tesla and whomever. Yeah. And of course, so talk to us a little bit about what you're actually building in terms of capability. Like, do you have a software center of excellence? Are you distributing we, these folks? How do you it's, do? It's, um, no, look, what I'm focused on is, I mean, what I'm focused on is creating good core engineers and hiring good core engineers, people who can code Java, <laughs> Who can who, who can um, uh, build infrastructure? Who can code in all of the open source? We're a huge open source house, um, and you know th that's what I need. I need people who can create computer software. So that's what I'm building, and it's not just it's not rest center of excellence. It's kind of it's more embedded into the entirety of the organization, and I, and again I think that's important. You know, as engineers, we're good at some stuff, we're not good at others, and you need to leave the creative people being very very creative, and then we can turn that into algorithms without a problem. So it's, it, but growing that engineering capability is vital to our future. And how do you get sort of the domain know-how experts, the supply chain folks, or the merchandising folks, or the pricing folks to work with these teams? Well, we work, I mean, the way we work, we do work in Agile, right? So you've got, you tend to have uh, small scrum teams, perhaps eight engineers. Um, and in those eight engineers, you will have embedded somebody from merchandising, we have a product manager from merchandising who owns the software product as a whole. They're the people who manage the backlog, and the, what, so what are we going to build next? So the whole process is completely intertwined. The old, as you know, the old waterfall process is you'd have some business analyst from, uh, we'd go out, write down a whole load of stuff, interview a load of people, write it down, that'd be your functional spec, you'd translate it into a technical spec, 18 months later you'd come up with something that everybody hated and didn't really work anyway. Um, so, you know, it, and it, it, so this way, you know, and this way, there are no handoffs. I mean, they're right. completely, the, you know, the, the merchants, the supply chain guys are completely embedded in the software development process, um, which means that, again, you iterate, you learn, you can change things on the fly. Um, and it's just it's a much, much more productive way of working. And the, the results don't fail. So uh, please prepare for questions. I have one last question for Mike, and then I'm going to turn it over to so runners. Please get ready, and please raise your hands. So the last question for you, uh, for me anyway, is um, what's the right leadership structure for digital transformation? Um, you know, is Why are you like, asking me? <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, but, I mean, look, I mean, there's no set model, right? I mean, it's all very, it's all very new to us all. So I don't think there is a, I don't think there is a, a set single. model, a single model. Now, I, as it happens, I'm, I'm CIO and I'm CDO. Right. Of, of, of Target, so uh, all of the, you know, the Target.com P&L is mine. But that's, that's just one model. There are tons of others. I, you know, you, you kind of think, that I well, personally think CDO, CDO, CIO, they're transitionary 
yes. uh, roles. I mean, I, I think as I've seen executives and younger executives come through the business, and they were right up at EVP level now, who actually have a really good understanding of technology. They may not be able to sit down at a keyboard and uh, knock out a program in Groovy or something, but they do actually understand and appreciate what right. it takes to build software. So I, I think my, I'm an endangered species. Yeah? My, my role ought to go away. It ought to be just part and parcel of every executive's job. Um, so and, and between now and then, there'll be lots of transitionary um, type, type organizations. Excellent. Uh, questions for Mike? The one over here. Gideon, Corey, Triance, um, and my question, Mike, is do you see privacy as a commodity that can be monetized at Target? You know, talking about example a couple of years ago where somebody was sent a coupon because, uh, because a woman was pregnant and she, you know, nobody in the family knew about that. <laughs> so is there a way to monetize <laughs> privacy? Uh, because people are ready to pay for it right now. Well, listen, I, 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 to be fair, look, I don't think that's the business we're in right now. I, 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 I don't really want to be mon monetized. I wouldn't want to be monetized. I don't think Target would want to be monetizing privacy. Um, you know, personalization is a different thing, you know, and, and, you know, everything we're striving to do is to make you get that paradox of choice, right, to reduce the options of gazillions of things down to uh, a fewer options that are relevant and pertinent to you. I, I think that's what it's about. It's not about anything to do with privacy. You know, we would hold, you know, private data very, very, very secure. Um, so, uh, and it's clearly, you know, given the position we're in, that's extraordinarily important to target because if we had anything that went, uh, went awry, it would be enormously da brand damaging. So I, I wouldn't be in the business of uh, monetizing privacy. I mean, I think it's not a guest first type thing, right? You, you know, I think one of the great things about Target is that it does start with our guests, with our customers, and then we work back from that what we need to do. We don't really start with, well, you know, how can we make more money? We start from a guest point of view, and then how do we service guests better? Um, and, and work back then to what, what it is we're actually going to do. And personalization and personalized offers are great, and they work really well, and people love them. Our guests love them. Um, you know, say uh, three million people a week scan their, scan their phones at our point of sale to get personalized coupons. That's a question over there. What kind of efforts do you put into uh, securing your customers' data, and then how do you assure them that it's secure? Well, I mean, I, the, only, the, the only real assurance is that it stays secure, right? I don't think you can tell people it's secure, it's secure, it's secure. Yeah, I believe Mike, tick. Um, I think it, you, you have to demonstrate that it is, uh, that it is secure by it, ne it never leaking again. And clearly Target is in a, say, is in a, in, is in a, 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 in a unique position when it comes to it. When I joined two years ago, um, you know, there was a lot of things joining Target, right? You know, and one of the, of course, one of the things is data security because of, uh, because of the breach. Um, but actually, it turned out to be the least of my worries because, and not because I'm unconcerned about it, I'm extraordinarily concerned about it each and every day. But Target's response to the data breach was magnificent, absolutely magnificent. We brought in uh, people who'd worked in the defense industry um, and we had, uh, and we applied defense contracting type mentality um, to our internal processes. So now we have a very, very strong uh, data security organization um, who, funnily enough, have ripped out an awful lot of the technology we had before, um, not because it wasn't useful, there was probably too much of it. So they've honed in, worked what the operation is, what the process is, what the organization has to be to keep the data secure. So they, they have responded remarkably well. But I think the only, the only proof you can give guests ultimately is that you do actually keep their data secure. Over there. Uh, Angela Moran, Warden Brown Companies. This is more of a tactical question about your scrum teams. Do the product owners actually uh, live in IT or are they in the business and loaned to IT? They're, they're, they're a full time, they're all in the business is, is the short answer, right? So they, they, they don't report to me. Um, they report to the various product managers who sit in merchandising, supply chain, retail, etc. So 
there is no, they, they're not, they're not technique, they're not, uh, you know, they're not regarded as technology folks, they are business folks who sit in the teams. Sorry, do you want to? Let's, let's take another, no, we, we've got Just lots of questions, so let's take one over there. Uh, this is Murli Raj Gopalan from InnoMinds. I had a quick question on now with plethora of, and you said you use open source with tools and platforms available. For your digital transformation, how do you go about uh, choosing? Because I see there's a lot of options available in variety. There sure are, <laughs> and, there, and there's more every day. You just can't keep up with all of the new things that come into the, into the open source area. I mean, the reality is I allow my engineers to choose. Uh, and not that every engineer can have their own individual choice, but um, as, a, as a group, they tend to choose which, which tools we want. So I, you know, my, very, very simply, I have a quarterly architecture review. Uh, if there are a body of engineers who come and say, look, we think Kubernetes is the be next best thing, um, this is what we think it, then we will examine whether or not we should use Kubernetes. And then we, we would start it in one area. If it worked out, then we'd expand it along. So uh, you know, open, so open source has been magnificent when it comes to software development. You know, all of those really boring, horrible, laborious processes that you used to have to do about configuration management, pushing things through, um, through different uh, environments, testing, all of that is, we've largely automated. And in Target, we've largely automated it over the last year and a half. So the productivity has gone through the roof. And, and what that really, and, and actually we're big contributors back to open source. And um, we've just you know, put in around 50,000 lines of code back into the Spinnaker project. Um, but uh, what, what the, the real value of that to the business is that software is cheap. Right, software, because of all that laborious stuff you used to have to do, was expensive and it took a long time uh, because it was all manual. Now it's cheap. That means I can write supply chain systems in six weeks, and if they don't work, hell, start again. You know, and, so, and, and that's what's really good about it, is that you can create new things really, really quickly, really cheaply. If they don't work, you can afford to just bin them. So we need to wrap, but I'm going to give you just two sentences, if you don't mind, to say, what are your parting, what's your parting advice for attendees who are not as for long in digital transformation as Target is? Uh, look, you have to get on board. It is the future. Um, and you know, we've talked about a lot of um, you know, guest-facing stuff here, but it's just important within the enterprise. If you can create software that will drive a car around autonomously, you can create software that will match invoices against goods receipt notes. So there's a whole lot, there's a ton of opportunity within, within, within the, the back office, if you like, of the business to improve productivity. There, uh, if you're a, a guest facing business like Target, clearly it is essential. And if you don't invest, you won't survive. Well, with that, let me thank Mike for a fascinating discussion. Um, appreciate Thanks, you coming. Okay.